Ladies and gentlemen, Grandmaster Peter Swidler is in the building. I hope you guys can hear him. If that is the case, it would be very kind if you could let us know for a second, because Techian is never sure about the sound. Peter, how are you doing? Uh, doing okay. I'm being eaten alive as usual. And this room is some kind of a petting zoo for mosquitoes. I don't know. It's they seem to multiply by division over whatever, so it's, it's difficult. Do you still have and mosquitoes in Russia? I thought we we were out of mosquitoes nowadays. No, no, no. These are sort of uh, purebred St. Petersburg mosquitoes. You know, we live on a swamp, so and and by this point they're completely immune to like all the modern technology and. I covered myself in like three layers of incredibly badly smelling crap and I'm still getting it alive, so. I'm sorry the to things, hear that. The, the, yeah, the things you do for, you know, love of your wonderful show. Mit Swidler Kommunizirt. So, what are your impressions thus far of the Sinkfield Cup while the last round is running? It's been a it's been a weird tournament, right? And uh, for me, as a senior citizen, I think the the biggest takeaway is incredible sadness, because sort of by rights, this would have been one of Vichy's biggest triumphs. I just brought that up. Vichy could easily it might be a stretch, but he could very well have had plus four, plus five just by converting yeah, yeah, yeah. winning I mean, positions, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, plus three, plus three is the absolute rock bottom estimate of where he should have been. It's, it's, it's nowhere, like, it, it can't be any lower than that. And the fact that he's still on plus one is, is a travesty. And, uh, yeah, um, as, as someone who is a lifelong fan, uh, I'm, I'm very sorrowful about that. Is that more the old guard sticking together, or are you just like Vichy? I think both would be would be the, the, the obvious choice for me. I mean, we're we're on very good terms, but also I think uh, seeing Vichy just destroy this field, which is, you know, being spoken about as arguably the the strongest round robin in history. And I mean, these things are all very very subjective, and I've seen this idea being ridiculed on the internet due to, you know, rating inflation and blah, blah. But it's definitely on the list somewhere. Uh, and it would have been wonderful for Vichy to just absolutely run away with it. And he would have, because nobody else really is showing anything much. Not to take, not to take things away from Dink, who I think is playing a very, a very good tournament and might end up uh, winning it outright. But... Uh, Vichy, Vichy would have been way above that, including, I believe, victory over Ding himself, right? So... Yeah, so what what did he miss? He was kind of completely winning against Ding. Um, multiple yeah. chances, but of course Ding defended well, but he should have won that one. Against Wesley, he was also winning, but sort of not that clear cut. There were one or two moments, right? Yeah, against Wesley, I mean, finding Queen of One, if, if this is not in your files, uh, finding queen of one in that position and calculating that entire variation to its end, where you give mate on g7, it's it's slightly superhuman there. It's it's not impossible, and once again, Vichy in his prime uh, may have actually found it. But it's one of those where uh, I think uh, your it's a, it's a normal situation which we we all learn to recognize, where basically if people tell you the answer exists your chances of finding the answer increase like exponentially. But if you're not sure, if you just know your position is better, but you don't know if you're winning or not, mm -hmm. Vichy ended up thinking for like 20 minutes and he found a very nice continuation, which gave him very good winning chances. And at some point you just take something like that because you think, okay, maybe this is the most I have. Uh, and uh, yeah, Wesley, I don't really count because that was a very, very difficult, uh, difficult thing to find. But yeah, the game against Ding, the game against Stanish, those are the two most obvious ones where it, it was kind of difficult to see how he would end up not winning those. And 
he ended up not winning them. Yeah, I'm trying to put some positions on the screen. Against Anishi, I think there were some even direct position, direct solutions outside of the opening, but also this position he had with the four against three and that ending looked very, very close to winning. <laughs> yeah, sure, but but honestly, like to my eyes, I think Vichy in a in a slightly more cheerful mood, or simply Vichy, let's say twenty years ago, would have just gone knight three d four instead of c3 if you're actually as, as as you have showing it on the screen if we just go back to the position where he played c3 which is not a bad move by any stretch but just play knight d4 queen g4 and just give mate right. <laughs> and it's I'm, I'm pretty sure he would have chosen something like this in a blitz game even now but in a classical game he um he went through you know the usual uh the usual thing of trying to count this to the end and black has so many moves here that you need to refute and then you find a very nice sort of controlled way of uh, getting a very good position and you decide not to bother uh but yeah just just go 94 and give mate yeah then there was the ding game where there were some ways to give mate but in general the position was just yeah so and once again yeah, you could you could you could make an argument that like, there I could sort of see how he was going wrong, because first of all, uh, people were, uh, because I kind of glanced over it and I, did, I didn't really concentrate on it very much. But even if we don't take this position, let's go back like three moves. Instead of rook takes c1 there. Knight c4, yeah? Yeah, just go knight c4, bishop goes somewhere, you go knight g4 and rook g6. I mean h6. And once again, it's just so incredibly difficult to believe this is not made. <laughs> because black is just wow. like every single piece apart from... Someone clip that for us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was too distracted by your mosquito catching. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the old Mr. Miyagi thing without much success, but... Wow. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like... Wax off. Yeah, I mean, in this position, we've we've given up one pawn for this, and like all of our pieces are very much giving mate in the in the immediate future. It's just incredibly difficult to imagine White ever holding this. But of course, he was winning. He was winning anyway after Rook takes C1. So, but I think after Rook takes C1, he was basically torn between the idea of just trading queens somewhere and winning winning a technical endgame. And yeah, also, and also feeling... giving mate or not. Yeah, like... yeah exactly. Like, uh, it felt like he was very conflicted and he couldn't quite commit to either, you know, one way of winning or the other. For example, here like knight here... before is winning, but it's yeah. maybe not so easy if you're already material up to give a piece for mate or not mate. Yeah, but then again, uh, it felt to me like maybe... Uh, by this point, he already missed a couple of uh, a couple of chances, and he he kept on, I think, restricting himself from fully committing to to one way of converting this tremendous advantage. And somehow, after like he played queen c six, uh, bishop p one, right? Yep. And already there, I felt that it's kind of slipping away. Not because simply he missed ninety four, but because. It felt like he was trying to win it without really ever calculating to the end, just by making good, sensible moves. And it, the position already looks like this might not win. Do you feel this has getting, gotten harder against these young guys that play so concretely, like that Vichy would just win this position by hand in the old days, but nowadays the Dings and Fabis and so yeah. on? Yeah. Uh, I think I think that's also very true because yeah people people just don't give up anymore, and you know, uh, general wave in the in the direction of of our public, uh, <laughs> by people I obviously don't mean myself. Uh, but yeah, it's winning a chess game has become a lot harder in recent years. I feel in in general and uh, and the young brigade they will continue calculating. They will continue putting up resistance, and you you do need to finish them off somewhere. That brings us to today's game, while Tachyon is doing miracles here with the camera. Do you yeah, think Magnus Carlsen will manage to win a game? 
the second yeah, game it's, in a row. It's it's not impossible at all. I quite I quite like his position, and also I think he sort of got exactly what he wanted out of today's game, mm. which is a very playable position with. Uh, you know, very unclear, very unbalanced structure, all things that he generally enjoys. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how Black makes a lot of progress here, but sort of in terms of character of the position, I think he should be extremely satisfied with how it came out. How does he keep doing it? Not that it worked in every game in this tournament, but to get these fresh positions while sort of playing his repertoire, I'm always a bit intrigued. Well, uh, today I think he he got plenty of cooperation from MVL, who is seemingly also very much in favor of uh, of just playing a game, because, I mean, Bishop 6 BC, if White wants to make a force draw here, uh, I think it will be kind of difficult for, uh, for Black to do very much about it, because like the the battle line, the battle lines have been drawn quite, uh, uh, quite definitively in the uh, B Bishop G7, Knight H6 lines. Like if you if you look at Gelfand and Dubov games, uh, you can aim for very specific positions where you can try and prove a small edge for White without any risk whatsoever. Yeah, either here or in the 94 as well instead of H3. For instance, like like I played against uh, Dubov in Israel, and then Vichy played against uh, whoever it was, possibly Dubov as well. Right. Takes, takes, d5, d5, f6, e6, for instance, this line. Right. It's very, very concrete, and White never risks a single, a single hair on his head there. It's just very safe for White. Yeah, so what's going on in the current position? Rookie three has been played. What do we want to do? I was looking at Queen of Eight to try and play Bishop H six, but I'm wondering if White can still play Bishop takes E five because, of course, I well, I mean, I'm, I say of course, I'm not entirely sure about this, but I have a feeling we would like to be taking on E five with the F pawn, not the D pawn. Although maybe even G five is fine because, in general, I think Queen of Eight Bishop H six is uh, is quite a sensible thing to to aim for. And here, bishop h6 next move will still be quite strong, right? So I don't really feel like we should be too worried about spoiling our structure a little bit. Also, there's a question of bishop takes e5, bishop h6 immediately, which uh, looks a bit weird, but might work. But Magnus decides to... Yeah, he played knight c6 instead, so he clearly doesn't want to uh, start calculating anything, anything concrete just yet. It's also there a fairly a question valid question, why not bishop h6 directly if we want to exchange these guys? So I think we should, no, I was about to bring this up takes, yeah? even here. Yeah, you take and you take on g3, and because the, the knight cannot go to g6, uh, I think white is immediately maybe close to winning there. Oh, e6. And after knight c6, the thing about knight c6, it actually probably still allows h6 in the current position. Ah, I, yeah, I missed e6 altogether, oh, sorry. Okay, that's fine. But even in that position, I think it's quite unclear. Maybe maybe White goes knight of three, and it will be very difficult to unpin yourself. But after knight c6 here, I think maybe I can still try playing h6. But I have a feeling he wants to just go bishop f8 there. He doesn't need any of this, like knight g4 here or whatever. I don't think he needs any of this whatsoever, as black. I think he'll just go bishop f8 quite happily, put the rook on g6, and then continue playing with the with the king side quite secure because uh, I think in the end in some kind of an end game this pawn on h6 will just die uh, so my feeling is he is not plan also I want to point out that maybe his plan is h6 e5 <laughs> that would be quite cute Ooh. Yeah. just just as a as the final mention of candidates, yeah? Hg rook bg7, then we take the bishop, then we take on g2. Also looks quite attractive, right? Beautiful. Yeah, so I guess h6 is just not a move you can make. Next topic I have to ask you about. Okay, let's first maybe look at the position, but... Mr. Nipponashi, what happened to him yesterday and why? 
Yeah, I, sp I spoke to him briefly today, and uh, he kind of, uh, his tweet can be read in a number of ways there, but he seems to be implying this was a kind of a misclick. He in said, the tweet, when and you want to go 96 and play 97, so that sounded like a slip yeah, of the I, hand or something. I, yeah, I, I asked him if it was a straight up misclick, if he just sort of placed the piece on the on the square, he was not intending to put it. And he said it was a combination of, like it was some kind of a, like a mind fart, but not exactly just a pure misclick. Like he was looking only at knight uh, knight c6, and then sort of he he reached for the knight, and while he was still kind of in finally calculating all these positions, it just occurred to him that knight g7 looks quite attractive. And he says, of course, I didn't see bishop d6, so I wouldn't have done it, but like all of his calculating time prior to playing knight g7 was spent looking at knight g6 exclusively. And then in the very final moment, he just kind of corrected himself to knight g7 and had to resign more or less. So yeah, not ideal. Do you feel he's... This is going to be a weird question. He has a lot of room for improvement if he gets rid of these sometimes blackouts he has, or do you feel it's also part of his strength that he plays so quickly and puts pressure and thereby sort of risks sometimes things going wrong? Because I'm always confused about it. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure because I think he, like, his results I think quite clearly show that there's been like a watershed somewhere around maybe two years ago uh, somewhere in that neighborhood where quite clearly he uh, gave up on a lot of his extra I can't pronounce that word but on all the other stuff he was doing in his life and decided to concentrate uh, concentrate on chess quite more, a lot more seriously How's his Dota showing. 2 and Hearthstone career going? He, he quit most of the things more or less so he, he, Yeah, he still plays some video games but nowhere near as much and just mainly to wind down, whereas at some point he was like a serious competitor, and it was it was very much part of uh, part of his uh, makeup. Um, and I mean the <clears throat> the gift was never really in doubt, so it's not a huge surprise that he is doing well now that he's actually taking the game a lot more seriously. But yeah, I think the question, like, you, you, whenever you hear a question like the one you asked, I think normally the answer will be a little bit of both. Uh, because uh, you, you, you never know what will happen to somebody like him if you try to sort of completely curtail uh, his natural, natural instincts. And his natural instincts, instinct has always been to play extremely fast because you know when in, in particular when in good form he can definitely afford to play very fast because he is a he is a very fast calculator and he also generally understands the game well enough not to not to do very many things too wrong what do you think about his position right now against my boy Guirinho? well i'm i'm pretty sure of this Almost all of this must have been in, in Anish's file. I'm a little bit surprised by knight g4, but because I was, at first I was kind of curious, how do you even reply to bishop f5? But I'm sure there is a solution of some kind. Uh, it was worrying me for, for a second there, but... And also, as is often the case, uh, when I don't do commentary, I find it very difficult to actually switch the, switch the engine line off. And I did see that the engine was more in favor of HP5 on the previous move. <laughs> True. Uh, <laughs> I guess you can just play Queen C1 or whatever here. I don't know. I was. Or maybe even Knight F5, G5, and Rook B3. And we say that the F5 pawn is hanging and it's important. Something along those lines. I don't know. So. Give us evaluation. White slightly better? White ever so slightly better, probably, yeah. But I, I think black should be able to hold this with uh, with accurate play. And I think the next couple of moves will be very telling because obviously if white gets the pawn from c5 to c7, you know, all of this will be completely invalid. Even maybe c5, c6. If, if c5, c6 happens and black hasn't achieved anything yet, you're in a lot of trouble because... Uh, rook c5 will be a very important source of sort of unpinning your pieces because currently 
the white pieces in the center feel a little bit sort of bunched together and uh, you constantly have to watch out for, you know, bishop goes somewhere, e75 counterplay, this type of stuff. But, uh, yeah, if white manages to solve the immediate issues, he might be quite significantly better. Uh, so, very, very concrete, and I expect black should not be uh, in a lot of trouble if he plays perfectly, but he will have to play precisely for the next, I don't know, three to five moves. <laughs> How about, uh, first of all, we were having a little nickname competition for Ding. Where do you stand on Ding Kong? <laughs> I did not have enough uh, time to prepare for, for this line <laughs> of questioning. So uh, I don't stand particularly anywhere. Wow. But yeah, why not? <laughs> and? He's a, I, I think he's a little bit... He's a little bit too, mind, too, too mild of a guy for... <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree. It doesn't really match his persona that well. Yeah, like, But his chess has been impressive. Yeah. If this is used sort of specifically to describe his chess strength, it's not much of a stretch. But he's an incredibly polite, mild-mannered young man and in, in that respect it's a little bit... It's a little bit uh, ill-fitting, but I'm not very much against it. Uh, I haven't actually, now that I see the position on the board, I'm slightly surprised because I thought, uh, I mean, Shah is not in any kind of trouble anyway, but I thought he was maybe even up slightly better at some point, and this is a bit confusing to me that this is what they have on, on the board. But maybe Shah is still playing for a win here. Yeah, the equal is. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I thought just takes, takes, and rook c1, but then b5 is kind of awkward, yeah? You might end up losing the b2 pawn, actually. I don't, I don't actually see how to preserve the b pawn. <clears throat> and that wouldn't be so great for, for white, obviously. a3, a5, I think, changes very little. You yeah. might not you might not lose this position in the end, but yeah, you you don't want to you don't want to test it. So yeah, maybe maybe White just doesn't have immediate equality yet. Like you can take take on that b5, but after rook c2, once again, you're not that happy. Should still be a draw somehow. Like rook d1 here maybe, and then rook d7. What's happening? Did he play it? Too safely? Where did he go wrong? I didn't. We missed. Well, a he made moves. he made an incredibly weird move knight of three d four, which uh, yeah, a, a little bit earlier than that. Yeah, yeah, he just he just played a move which I couldn't understand at all, which seemed completely like it was played quickly, and also queen takes d four was played quickly. Oh, right, I'm not g five, huh? Yeah, I have a feeling he may have spotted g six g five a little bit too late. Yeah. Must be. Because, I mean, nobody goes knight d4 with the intention of playing queen takes d4 and queen oh, c5. Yeah, it's insane. Oh, wow. That's very out of character. Blunder for Ding, no? It is, and it's... Yeah, I'd, I'd be very stunned if this is what happened, but also why on earth would you go knight d4 in this position otherwise? Like, make a move. Rook bishop d1, h6 if you want to play it safe. Like, yeah, bishop h6 is... Oh. Yeah, you're, you're never ever worse after be In fact, you might make an argument for being ever so slightly better, but probably not. But yeah, like zero risk in all of these positions. And and you go knight d4 and then you force to take with the queen, play queen c5 and play all of these sort of slightly uh, slightly worse end games like the one he is now defending. I expect he will defend it, but it's it's still such a weird such a weird sequence from him. And I have a feeling also that maybe somewhat subconsciously he is uh, trying to play very safe today to make sure he uh, gets at least a tie for first. He, I, I feel like he's not uh, playing sort of too sharply for a win today. Yeah, they got this rook ending. A bunch of things have been exchanged. I guess yeah, rook c3, I rook d7 is in rook. time. So king f7 or whatnot. Does black have any realistic winning chances here? I mean, you still obviously pick black. Like king f7, rook d3, you play e5, king e6, then you start all the rook c4, rook a4, rook a3 stuff. 
Maybe. Maybe. Right. How do you weigh Ding in general? Because now there's been some debates like, is Ding the favorite for the next candidates? I was arguing it's still Fabi, but he's beaten Fabi. Twice in a row, he's closing in on Fabi in the world rankings. Do you have opinions on those? Well, not once again, not a very well defined opinion, but uh, and it, it will sound like a hedge, but uh, it's not entirely a hedge. Uh, I think it's basically between those two. I think uh, on current form, uh, very few people will be able to even enter into the conversation. Obviously, by the time the candidates happens, many things can change. But from what I see, you know, from everybody else who is uh, potentially in the candidates, and there has been sort of breaking news in the Magnus game, so we should maybe, yes, while we talk about on. this. Minus uh, four, I'm reading the chat, someone said it's minus four for Magnus, does that mean Yeah, and also the solution, the solution is, very, is a very magnus -y solution. He played, after Queen F2, he played a five, which the machine, I don't know why, I wasn't looking at the machine, but the machine didn't really like a five very much. And MVL in reply did something that he does a lot these days, which is, you know, this is a very complicated position, he has an hour and a half, and he just magnus, blitzes out, and he blitzes out, he just blitzes out knight of three. And now you take on c3 and you play e5. And I think Magnus, this is just such a, you know, Magnus should spot this normally because positionally it just makes so much sense. It's very much in his style also, no? Clarity, yeah. get rid of the bishop, rook comes. Yeah, then you play a 5 a 4 and you just give mate on the king side. You, you, you don't even need to calculate. Everything gets closed down and then all of your pieces start giving mate. Like the knight goes to d4. Rook goes to g7, queen goes to f6, bishop h3 is an immediate threat in many positions. It's just dead. But but also you, you, you have to wonder how can you spend a minute a minute fifty on knight f3 in this position? Yeah, I think the uh, dynamics between these guys are still strange. Sometimes, yeah, Maxim blitzes out strange things against Magnus. We've also talked, I think, even with you on this before that Maxim might just have played too much chess he's probably yeah really out of energy sure. at this point sure and uh, yeah kasparov i think in his uh, visit to the the mainstream also expressed some opinions on the topic and i think without any kind of uh, you know intention to 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 insult maxim or anything he he is not the maxim we we know and love currently and he needs he badly needs a break somewhere to to recharge, and I don't even mean like the break from the insane schedule of 2019. He just hasn't looked particularly himself uh, for a while. And Bishop takes e3. Yeah, it didn't take Magnus very long to play this. Uh, so yeah, Magnus will actually, I guess, very likely just recover his tournament completely by by winning the last two. There might even be the super plot twist. He might win the tournament outright if Ding loses his rook ending. Yeah. Magnus might just win it outright, which would be sort of a surprise given two days ago. Yeah, it's uh, it's not the obvious outcome we, we could have predicted, but it's sort of in keeping with how 2019 was going, but not the St. Louis part of it. Absolutely. Robert, have you met Peter? Any questions for... No, oh, it's oh, allowing me to, to, to listen, yeah, um, because, um, yeah, I'm very surprised. It's, uh, it's For me, it's similar uh, uh, what happened with Nepo, yeah, uh, last game, that he's playing so quickly this, this blunder. Um, okay, I was all, um, in my opinion, I don't know, after F5, the position was also bad for White, or what is what is the next move? What is the normal move in this position? Instead of knight f3, yeah? Yeah, instead of knight f3. I think, I think you take on a 5 you, because like your, your pieces actually start start breathing a lot better if you if you mm -hmm. just take. You take and uh, you're not that worried about bishop d4 because I think uh, giving up a rook for this bishop, you are generally in positions like this, you're quite happy. Yeah, you must because lose you, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you you will have to do it, but you're not, you're not that sad. Like you make a move, mm -hmm. I don't know, knight mm -hmm. f3 here or whatever. And you just play. Uh, you just play for uh, for dynamic compensation, and you 
you shouldn't be you shouldn't be that upset about all this. And also, you know, Maxim of all people understands dynamic counterplay extremely well. Uh, but even even let's say if you end up not liking this and you end up making a mistake, you have an hour. He, yes, at yes, that yes. time, he had like an hour thirty-five. Yes, yes, yes. There is yes, absolutely yes. no reason. No reason. Not, yeah. Not mm. to not to actually spend some. T- it's a it's a very complicated position with like twenty eight pieces on the board. <laughs> Just think for a bit. Mm-hmm. It's you know it's not going to kill you or anything. Yeah, the point is, man. Or maybe maybe if um, if uh, Shakhtar is uh, winning this uh, this uh, this game, it's possible that uh, Magnus uh, win this tournament alone. Yeah, yeah, it is. It up. is not impossible now. Yeah, mm. although I mean the, the the advantage Shah has here, I don't know how big it is. Once again, I'm uh, I I stuck my head above the parapet recently uh, on one end game question, and uh, I kind of expected to be completely wrong and to be ridiculed for it, and this is exactly what happened. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna express a definitive opinion on this rook end game. I have no idea how bad it is, but it's not pleasant. I would be quite scared with white here if I had to fold this with white. All right, last position we haven't touched. Dr. Fabi against Sergei Kayakin. Yeah, what's happening there? It's better on white. Whoa, a lot of things changed since <laughs> since I looked at it the last time. We should mention if Kayakin wins, he ends on plus two as well. So he can very much still win this tournament. I saw. Yeah. Also, yeah. Although, yeah, he, he hasn't been... Involved in a lot of action, but he hasn't lost a game. He won one, and here he is. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah I, I'm somebody told to that the computer's better, better for black in this position. Yeah. No. I don't know. In the chat, when people are talking about this, uh, normally I, I prefer white, yes, but. Uh, well, structurally, you sort of prefer white, but queen f6, then we take on oh, e6, six. then we play. Uh, I don't know if I even need queen f6, but like that would be the immediate first idea, yeah, to play queen f6 to control the long diagonal, I guess. Well, yeah, white to move. Uh-huh. White to move, yes. Ah, sorry, After yeah, okay, I, I'm, uh, I'm an idiot. As yeah, well for yeah. yeah, that that explains that explains the reason why I, I wasn't so sure white is doing well. But yeah, th- then I think white should be doing quite uh, quite well after something like bishop b2. And if you take on e6, maybe I can even play knight d4 and get the knight over to some square like a five, where it would be quite well positioned. Oh, but it looks very good for white. I like the yeah, white I mean, position, it, yeah? It, it could also become very sharp. Like one one example of a variation I can give is maybe something like in this position rookie six. Uh, we try playing knight d4. Uh, black goes bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, queen e7. And we can win the b7 pawn. Yeah, mm-hmm. we take, take, play queen e7 here. Yeah, and uh, if white wants, he can win the pawn on b7, but he might get mated after rook f8 in the end of that variation. Because once again, black has only good pieces left on the board. And... Yeah, yeah, that's come on, Spiel. Yeah. Then again, maybe rook ac1 is just fast enough, and maybe white has enough uh, enough play against the black weaknesses here not to be worried about mate, but it becomes very, very concrete. Who knows what this is? All right, so we have some action to look forward to. Peter, what are you up to? You're going to to the hometown of Chester, St. Louis soon? What, what's your plan? Yeah, um, I have a, a day and a bit left at home and then I'll fly. I'll spend the entire uh, Friday flying. Uh, and I, I decided to give myself a little bit more of a chance to, to acclimatize this time around. I don't know if it will, it will, if it will do me any good. So and then we're playing from the second until the, uh, I think the fifth, and then on the sixth I fly back. I what are you playing the, for those who don't know? Uh, I'm playing linear. Uh, in a chess nine sixty match, right? In, yeah, in a chess in a chess nine sixty match. So that's going to be quite exciting, and uh, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it, but. Yeah. After that, I basically I, I will have I will fly back home, repack. I will have uh, half a night's sleep, and then I'm I'm going to hunt it to play the World Cup. So, uh, lots of stuff going on. 
And best of all, you're coming to Hamburg in, I don't know, it's yeah. two months or something. But you'll play in Hamburg City, my city, in the FIDE Grand Prix in November. Yeah, and uh, this is where, you know, the the storied and fabled relationship between uh, uh, World Chess and Chess24 might, uh, <laughs> might be of interest. Yeah, it's a bit awkward because I want you to do commentary, but in order to do that, you have to get knocked out, and I also want you to win it. So I'm not quite sure how we can get. Yeah, this first of all, Wilson. first of all, that, and secondly, uh, I'm not entirely sure, sort of, what the Chess Twenty Four policy on covering the the Grand Prix is. Nah, so. I think we're fine these days. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure either, but I think that should be doable somehow. Okay, but 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 then yeah, then I expect that my my participation will be. Uh, I don't know about sweet, but reasonably short, and then I can just make a seamless transition from from making a fool of myself over the board to making a fool of myself <laughs> by, by watching other people making moves. That's the spirit. Well, best of luck for, yeah, the Chess 960 and the World Cup and getting knocked out quickly out of the FIDE Grand Prix. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. And talk to you soon. Yeah. Cheers. Ciao.